Father, we love you. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for humbling yourself, coming down to earth to make truth simple and visible. And your grace and your love made manifest fully for us. Thank you for making it logical that we can see with our eyes, that we can read your scriptures, that we can fully understand eternal life and destiny and love and truth in you, God. Thank you that you're always with us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. And you've given it us with your spirit until you return. Holy Spirit, thank you for being present, being here. Thank you for dwelling within us. Jesus, I surrender to you, spirit, soul, and body. I surrender to you fully. Please take full control of my thoughts, my words, my tone, my speed, my everything. Help me to be like you, Jesus, and magnify your word in you and the power of your scriptures, the power of your life, the power of your spirit to set us free and give us peace, calm, comfort. I pray for peace, calm, and comfort for the United States, for our world amidst the trials we're facing. I pray for a great awakening in the church of Jesus Christ here today and coming tomorrow. Lord, let your light shine. May the fire burn within. And would you keep us awake until the day of your return? Come, Holy Spirit, magnify Jesus in your name. Amen. We are in the book of Colossians, and before I get into the verses in Colossians, the Lord Jesus wanted me just to highlight a scripture that we're going to end with, but the importance, I want to make sure everybody captures it, so I want to start with it as well, because we're going to begin, and it's about comfort in the Holy Spirit today. The power of the Holy Spirit, one way he's called is the comforter in translations, in Greek translations. And so I want to start with a verse about him. And I'm going to read out of the King James, but when you look into the Greek, you see the term helper, advocate, comforter. They're all used as different names for the Holy Spirit. But I want to start with John 14, 26, because this is the scripture I believe the Lord wants me to highlight, to encourage you, to help comfort you and all of us in this moment. And it says this in John 14, 26, it says, But the Advocate, another name for the Advocate is Comforter, which we'll be talking about today, the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit is the Advocate, He is the Comforter, whom the Father will send in my name. Very important, in my name, in Jesus' name. This is Jesus speaking this. So the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. What's so important to understand is keeping this in context or cons can come out of it. The Holy Spirit, who is the Comforter, will be sent in the name of Jesus, will teach you all things. So it's sandwiched in between the name of Jesus, teaching you all things. And the key here is, and will remind you of everything. What does it say? I have said. So Jesus is the rhema word. He's the spoken word. The role of the Holy Spirit is to remind us of what Jesus has said. There is great deception happening in the church through people who are praying and hearing and believing they're being taught all things. They're taking a part of this truth without the full truth that it has to be what you see and what you hear through the life of Jesus. So he, the Holy Spirit does teach us all things, but that all things comes through reminding us everything I have said to you, what Jesus said. That's why the most important thing you can do in your spiritual growth and development is get to know what Jesus Christ said. Because then you will not be deceived. Because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And what he says is the most important thing. And the role of the Holy Spirit is to remind us of everything he has said. And in that, just to continue to strengthen the truth of that conviction, Hebrews 13, 8 through 9 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. 
So always keep that in your mind. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So whatever the Holy Spirit said through Jesus back then is what the Holy Spirit will speak through us today and forever. Jesus does not change. Therefore, that communication shouldn't change either. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And then it goes on to say, don't be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. Right now, there are all kinds of strange teachings. It says in the last days, there will be false Jesuses, false messiahs, false gospels, false prophecies. And it's becoming alarming to me more and more every day how much the scriptures are talking to the church specifically about the deception. The deception in the world's easier to understand because it's unbelief and it's all the immorality that comes with this. But so much in the gospel letters is the deception that will come into the church in the last days. But we don't need to be afraid because we know Jesus. We have the written word. We have the scriptures that is a double-edged sword that can divide soul and spirit, that can bring the absolute truth of the life of Jesus and what he said. And so we can stand on that so we don't get confused by strange teachings. There are strange teachings coming through the church from the far right extreme orthodox part of the Christian church and also the far left extreme charismatic church. And these strange teachings are coming by people saying, I prayed, I heard from the Lord, and this is what we should do. Well, that needs to be tested, and the test goes back to Jesus Christ. Did Jesus say that? Did Jesus do that? Because if Jesus didn't say that, nor did Jesus do that, then it is a false teaching or a false prophecy. Therefore, it's meant to be easy for us all to see and understand. And Jesus Christ is the uniting absolute truth for everyone. But the people that don't like that are people who are still immature and their self-centeredness there. And it's more isolation and individuality and self-promotion and self-gratification. Therefore, they don't like that because it can create their own types of teachings and traditions, which creates division versus unity, where unity should come to all of us because we can all see, we all can know Jesus, we can all understand because we have the scriptures and we have the Holy Spirit, so we don't need to be deceived. Lastly, Romans 8.29 says, For those God foreknew, He also predestined us to be conformed into the image of the Son. So you see, over and over in Scripture, it says we're all to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it's very simple. Whatever you see in Jesus, that is what we should be. That is what we should say. That is what we should do. Now, anything outside of that is a strange teaching. It's not hard to see and understand. It's just there's so much authority coming through uh, people of authority, older people, or people that have a large following or platform. And that weight of that force is getting people confused by strange teachings. But when we let the author of this and that authority, Jesus Christ, be our source then we never get confused. And so this is what we're going to be talking about and highlighting today is the advocate, the comfort of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in Jesus' name, will teach you all things and will remind you everything Jesus said. Let's look at part of that through Colossians and how it ties in. So in this, Colossians, we're wrapping up the final chapter, maybe in the next couple weeks, Lord willing, two to three weeks. And it starts out, and sometimes I need to brush up on my Greek, so I'm going to cheat by just putting the up there so that I don't mispronounce it. Forgive me if I ever do. But tukikos. So I'd always want to say taichikos in American. But it's called tukikos. Will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord. So someone who's a faithful minister, which is my goal and my aim, is a fellow servant, just a servant in the Lord, and that is Jesus. I'm just here to serve Jesus. He is the King, and Jesus is in you, and we're all to conform to be like Jesus. And so he established that, a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. 
I'm sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. So what's so important today's church is that we become faithful ministers of Jesus Christ just serving. Serving him who he is, helping people understand Jesus Christ, past, present, and future. But then the aspect of encouraging your hearts. Encouragement is a gift of the Spirit. It's highly, highly highlighted in scriptures. You know someone's in the right spirit when they're ministering Jesus to somebody and encouraging people's hearts. So encouragement is very, very important in the body of Christ. So what it means by encouraging your heart is someone's heart is aching, grieving, bitter, anxious. You can encourage them through the Lord Jesus Christ to help strengthen their heart in faith, hope, and love. Verse 9 says he's coming with Onesimus, our fellow and dear brother who is one of you. And they will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchos, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. So you do see Paul is using his apostolic authority and saying, welcome him. Make sure you welcome him. Paul was always about welcoming, hospitality, encouraging, strengthening, equipping. And he is the foundation along with Christ. And we can see that conforming into the image of the Son. So welcome him. Verse 11. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God. So in the early stages of the ministry, there was not many Jews that were co-workers with Paul. But in part, Paul was called to the Gentiles. Peter was called to the Jews. But there wasn't as many co-workers for the kingdom of God. Something that the Lord put on my heart, and I highlight it on there, see how it says, my co-workers. We need to start seeing... Getting the gospel of Jesus Christ and the, the redemption and reconciliation of Jesus Christ back to this earth as work. Something the Lord has burdened my heart with is to encourage the next generation to consider as your occupation to be a missionary. I believe God is putting in the heart of the younger generation to be missionaries, to be evangelists. But they're not being encouraged. You're not being encouraged enough that that is okay to choose as a work or occupation. That is as valuable, if not more valuable, than any other. And the modern church has kind of waylaid that and said, well, you should start here and then maybe go to that. And we need more of the younger generation who have the faith, like the apostles in their teens and 20s, to step out and be evangelists that have that time and have that strength and have that availability and that commitment and dedication in this very hour. If you're here today or listening online, if you have a calling on your heart, if you're a younger generation to step out to, to do mission work, I will do everything in my power to pray for you and to encourage you in that. Don't be afraid. The Lord is with you. But to see that it is work to bring the kingdom of God here and they proved a comfort to me. And this is what the Lord's really highlighted on my heart for, through this message in Colossians. Is the, the word comfort. The word comfort. Comfort is the Holy Spirit. Comfort is Jesus. As you'll see through scriptures here shortly. As the Bible always interprets the Bible. And you notice even Paul. It says they proved a comfort to me. You know someone is truly operating through the Holy Spirit when they're a comfort to you, when they're a blessing to you, because the Holy Spirit is the comforter. If someone is giving you life, then the Holy Spirit is in you. And this is primarily, if they're primarily the majority of their relationship, their communication to you is encouragement and comforting and life-giving, that is Holy Spirit. But if the majority of their communication, their language, their interaction with you is life-stealing, that is not Holy Spirit. If it's condemnation and critical, that is not Holy Spirit. So the proof 
as we often say in the modern, is in the pudding. If someone's a comfort to you, that's a proof that that person is operating in the Holy Spirit and it will allow deeper levels of authenticity through the author of the Holy Spirit in relationship to co-labor in one heart and one mind together. So they proved a comfort to me. So I'd like to highlight Jesus Christ and the comfort he can give us through 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 8. It says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, our Heavenly Father, our spiritual Father, the Creator of the universe, the heavens and the earth, is a Father of compassion. That is who He is. And that is who we are to become. The Holy Spirit inspires us to become like Jesus, and Jesus' role was to inspire everybody to become like the Father. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Scriptures are one. They are all part of the Trinity. You cannot separate them. They all magnify and glorify each other. And so in that, the Father is compassion. So if He is compassion, we too are to conform into compassionate people, encouraging people, comforting people. But it is a different level of comfort than the worldly comfort. And that goes on to highlight that in verse 4. He's the God of all comfort who comforts us in our troubles. So He's a father of compassion and the God of all comfort, all comfort, all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. So do you see it's different than just the worldly? Worldly comfort is not the same as godly comfort. Worldly comfort is a half-truth. It's basing most of its comfort just on natural things. So someone who's immature, they're trying to get comfort by trying to amass more stuff, trying to do less work, and have others do the work for them that they don't want to do. That's worldly comfort. Is trying to get away from the things that are trials. That's worldly comfort. So worldly immature comfort is where you're trying to isolate yourself away from trials. You're trying to get other people to do the work you don't want to do and trying to do less and less work. That is demonic. That's exactly what the devil is trying to do. Godly comfort is different. Godly comfort is comforting us in our trials, our troubles. And the Greek word here is the same word that is used for tribulation in the scriptures or the great tribulation. So the good news for us, I do believe the church will go through tribulation and the great tribulation. But the good news for us, because of the Holy Spirit, because of a Father of compassion, we can have comfort even in the midst of those trials. That is maturity, spiritual maturity that is so different, way different, that you're able to find comfort in tribulation. You're not separating yourself from tribulation. You're in it, and you can still find comfort. That is spiritual maturity. That is something that has to be grown up into. That is the fire of the spirit of the lamp of the ten virgins. That is the understanding of the return of the Lord. That is the oil of intimacy of grace and truth. Is the ability to have that comfort, that light, that peace in all our troubles so that we can comfort others in those troubles. For those who are choosing to become more like Christ who want to die to themselves to grow in this maturity, the goal is so that you become so mature that you can handle more and more tribulation. In fact, you choose to leave natural comfort to help others through their own because you're mature and know how to enter into that and keep peace. You can help those who don't have that yet out of those trials and tribulations. That's what you'll see coming up here more and more through scriptures. It says so that we can comfort those in any trouble. So we go through it so that we can grow and mature now to learn how to rely on the Lord, the Holy Spirit for peace and hope so that as the world becomes more trials and tribulation, we are strengthened in our faith so that we can comfort the, the least of these during those moments that have never gone through it. And in that, it says, with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So spiritual comfort from God is the exact opposite of natural comfort. 
That is why, unfortunately for the church, those who pursue more natural comfort now, they're doing it at the expense of learning how to find true comfort from the Holy Spirit in this day and hour. And the unfortunate reality is the days are going to get darker. Tribulation is going to increase. Therefore, people will struggle more and more if they choose to do that today. Verse 5, For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so if you're to be like Christ, you will share in the same sufferings of Christ. And those sufferings are not sickness. Jesus did not go through sickness. The sufferings are persecution. You will be persecuted because you're choosing not to be like the world. You are in it, but you're not of the world. And you're beginning to live a different way. And so you'll be persecuted by, by non-believers, but even more so persecuted by immature believers. Because your faith and your light is bright, anybody who's choosing to live in darkness is going to persecute you more because it convicts their own conscience of their dim light. When you look at the life of Christ, he was persecuted by the church, by the Jews. And so those who are not in the Holy Spirit or in a wrong spirit in the church will persecute you for walking out like Christ. And that is something so important for the younger generation. I wish somebody would have taught me that as I went into ministry when I was younger. I was surprised when I left the marketplace to come into the church and to realize I got more persecuted in the church than I did in the marketplace. But that is how Jesus was, and that is how it will be for us as well. But the good news is there is comfort. In fact, the more mature you get, the scriptures say you eventually find joy in your suffering. You get excited because of that suffering, because you know you're doing the right thing, and your heart gets strengthened by that. So we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. So there is a place that the greater the natural tribulation, the greater the comfort through the spiritual Holy Spirit. What a glorious reality for us as a church in these days. To know that the Holy Spirit will provide because we release as our heart becomes encouraged through the faith, hope, and love of Jesus Christ. It becomes strengthened and swollen by love that the power of the Holy Spirit can give us even greater spiritual comfort even in the midst of natural trials. He is always there. It's just us positioning our heart through faith in Jesus Christ that allows the flow and power of the Holy Spirit out to comfort us amidst everything. It goes on to say, comfort us abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, now here's the mature statement of Paul. Verse 6, if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. So as you grow in maturity, then you grow in becoming selfless. So you're willing to step out of your own natural com comfort to go help people who are uncomfortable and struggling. Because you now know how to find true peace and joy through Christ. So you don't need the natural things. You only need Jesus. And so then you, be, you become naturally more distressed for the sake of that spiritual comfort of helping somebody else. That is true maturity you see in Jesus Christ. He lived in the comfort of heaven, the new Jerusalem. And he came down to a broken world through tribulation and suffered and pierced for us. And then you see the very apostles, the first generation of the church do the exact same thing. And that is the foundation of spiritual maturity. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. Why is it important to understand patient endurance? Because there's an eternal plan to this. Jesus Christ is coming back. The world falls apart before he comes back. And we need to learn how to walk in the light of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the power and the comfort of the Holy Spirit now and keep our light lit. So as the world gets darker, our heart becomes stronger and more light not just for ourselves, but even greater for the sake of others in their time of need. 
And that is patient endurance. You're enduring through the trials and tribulations, which gives you the character of faith, which gives you more hope, and which gives you patient perseverance through it all, which grows you in maturity. Jesus Christ is not creating the trials and the temptation. James chapter 1 shares that clearly. The trials and temptations come through the devil and the fall of humanity. Jesus isn't removing us from those trials instantaneously. He is going to remove us eventually through the rapture. But he's allowing us to go through this to strengthen us in grace and truth and love and to understand the power of the Holy Spirit in Christ in us so that we grow and mature to become more like Jesus. Which we all can. Every one of you hearing this message can be just like Jesus and can walk just like Jesus did through the written word, the living word, and the Holy Spirit inspired. He is our uniting comforter. Verse 7, and our hope for you is firm. Your hope is firm. Hope is the anchor of the soul, according to the scriptures. If you want to be mature, you need to understand hope. And it says, and our hope for you is firm, because we know just as, just as you share in our sufferings. See, we will share in the same sufferings. Just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Verse 8, we do not want you to be uninformed. Christians, brothers and sisters, about the troubles or tribulation or affliction we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Hear Paul's heart here. He's saying, this pressure was beyond my own physical strength. There's a half-truth deception in the church Twisting some scripture that says God will never give you more than you can handle, thinking that I'll never have more than I can handle. But the proper interpretation is this God's not going to give you more than to handle, but the devil's going to try to. The devil is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And you've got to learn to rely on Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit and the comfort and the hope of who you are and what is coming. And the power to overcome everything in that moment and in that hour. Now is the time to become strong in Christ. Firm in Christ. He goes on to say, We despaired in life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. So here's Paul saying, I thought we were going to physically die. We had so much persecution. And that is what's going to happen in the world in various places. There is going to, there is already severe persecution in the world. It will go, it will come to the whole world in measure. Not in every single location and every single place, but it will be across the globe and the world. There will be persecution across the face of the earth. Indeed, we felt we received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on whom? Ourselves. We might not rely on ourselves, but on God who what? On God who raises the dead. That is the maturity the church has got to get to. The, it's called the power of the resurrection. If you want to be mature, you need to become deeply rooted and established in the Holy Spirit of power of resurrection, a bodily, physical resurrection. When Jesus died, he rose again, got his body back, walked on the earth. If you pass away and the Holy Spirit is in you, when Jesus comes, you get your body back and you walk on the earth again. That hope when that is the anchor of your soul, will change everything. If you don't have that hope, you will waver and you will struggle. It's the deeply rooted and established firm conviction of the resurrection that made the disciples change and become apostles who were afraid to be at the cross, but after they saw the resurrection, were choosing to be hung upside down because they no longer believed in death and they were not afraid of it. You need to understand the doctrine of resurrection and judgment 
and rely on the power of the Holy Spirit who does resurrect today but will also be re resurrecting in two different stages, first resurrection and second resurrection upon his return to the earth. Verse 10 says, who raises, sorry, let me back up so we get in context. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. So he has delivered us, and he will deliver us. There's two phases. Jesus came once, and he's coming again. We have the power to lay hands on, the doctrine of laying hands on, and resurrect people like Christ today, but that is an in-part resurrection. When he comes back, he's going to bring a full resurrection. And he will deliver us again. On him, we have set our hope. On him, on Christ's return and the full resurrection, we've set our hope. The acronym's not in the scriptures, that's mine, as a reminder to come to that hope. The hope I use to try to simplify it for the church is an acronym. As I shared last week, and I'll say it again, hold on, pain ends. That's how we think of hope. We put our hope in something that's more positive than our negative current situation. Hold on, problems end. That's what your heart, you're choosing in your heart to put your faith and hope in something to get you out of something you don't like. My encouragement to you through the scriptures, Jesus says, put all your hope, all, all your hope in him and his return. You put your hope in other things, it will be fleeting. You put your hope in him and his return. And the more you focus on that hope of his return, his judgment and his resurrection, then you'll have less problems as you go through trials and temptations. But if you put your hope more on natural things, natural circumstances, natural situations, you will waver in your faith, in your hope, and in your love. It's the measure that you put your hope in things. All the pain and the problems end when God destroys the devil who is creating the problems. But until the devil and his angels are destroyed in the lake of fire, there will still be a measure of problems. He is the one creating the problems. That is why we should have so much faith, hope, and love. We see and understand the bigger picture, and we want eternal life. We want paradise, and we now become evangelists. We become not just tutored disciples. We become apostles and forerunners to get the message out, to get the pure gospel, the total gospel out, and get Jesus back here so that we can have eternal life forever with him and the problems end if you want the problems to end if you want injustice to end if you call yourself a champion of justice true justice only comes through the judge Jesus Christ let us fight in him not with weapons of this world but with words, with the word, with thoughts, with actions, with communications to restore the King Jesus back to this earth. That is true justice, true judgment, the doctrine of the judgment day. In that, it goes on to say, on him we have set our hope that we, he will continue to deliver us. So knowing that God will continue to deliver as you remain in Jesus, as you remain in the Holy Spirit, He can help you overcome all trials and give you peace and even joy in suffering if you choose to commit your heart to Him. But it is a practice. The scriptures say you need to begin to practice your faith. If you just use this season to focus on natural comfort, you will not be learning how to practice spiritual comfort in the midst of tribulations. There is a very practical reality to discipleship becoming like Christ. In that, it goes on to say, in 11, as you help us by your prayers, see the power of prayer again, intercession, we can help each other through tribulations. The power of prayer. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. So the time for a prayer chain is when people are going through tribulations of persecution to help them get out of that. 
the time for healing, you just need one person of faith. One person that can lay hands on the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. A prayer chain is for someone that is going through severe physical persecution by others or demonic persecution as we see through scriptures in the order. And as we come through to 1 John, it says 2, 18 through 19, Dear children, this is the last hour. That word in the Greek also means time or season. It's saying the last season. As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. There are many Antichrists on the earth today. Opposite, opposing people and forces to the Christ Jesus. And there will be one Antichrist that emerges. He will be the exact opposite of the Christ. It will be obvious for believers. Jesus Christ did not get involved in politics. Jesus Christ did not get involved in religion, nor did he get involved in military. The Antichrist will be the exact opposite, the physical manifestation of the devil. He'll be highly political, highly religious, and highly armed, highly military. In there, the Antichrist is coming, and now many have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. But you have anointing from whom? The Holy One. You have an anointing from the Holy One. And all of you know the truth. The truth has a name. He's called Jesus. He said, I am the truth. He is the Holy One. Your anointing comes from Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. They're one and the same. You can't separate them. And He's the same yesterday and today forever. The anointing you and I have is the same Spirit of Christ Jesus to become like Christ Jesus. And all of you know the truth. You can go to the written scriptures, the red letters, and learn everything about the truth to not be deceived by strange teachings. 21, I do not write to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie comes from the truth. No lie comes from the red letters, the rhema teachings of Jesus Christ. Who is a liar? It is whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. So a liar is someone who denies that the anointing is Jesus. There are many, many, many false anointings out there right now. People are saying, I heard this from the, the Spirit told me this, and there's nothing about Jesus in what they're saying about the future or the present or the past or that person. If you hear anything that does not align with the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, it's a lie. And there's a lot of that prevailing in the church today. But the good news is, it's easy to see and understand. If you don't see in life of Jesus, we used to wear, dates me a little bit, a bracelet that said, what, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I put them in, I was going to create them, but I didn't get a chance to get them done. I was going to try to do a bracelet. I think a better way to say that is WDJD. What did Jesus do? Because whatever he did back then is the same he's going to do in the future. Because all you got to do is read the written word, look at the red letters, study his life, and then you won't be deceived by any false teachings or strange teachings or false prophecies or false gospels or false anointings. Because there's many people who are claiming to be anointed even by the Holy Spirit using that language. But it's very clear for anybody who knows Jesus and knows what he taught, that is not the right thing and it's a lie. But the good news is we have the written word and we have the living word. We have Jesus so we all can know the truth. Jesus Christ is the anointed one. He is the Holy Spirit. Such a person is the Antichrist, denying the Father and the Son. 23. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. See the acknowledgement of the Son? So the Holy Spirit's role is always to acknowledge Jesus Christ. 24. As for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. 
So whatever you begin, that's why you can start in the spirit, Galatians says, but get after the flesh. And that's what's happening a lot in the church today. People are getting saved. They're getting the spirit in them, but they're really not getting to know the word. And then they're hearing things and their traditions and their thoughts are not being tested. And, and it's leading whole people astray into strange teachings. But the good news is, safe place is Jesus Christ. Just get to know Jesus, and then you can see the truth clearly, because he is the anointed one. 24, as for you, see that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you also will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what the promise us, eternal life. So eternal life is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. 26, I am writing these things to you about those who are trying to what? So he's writing to the church, warning the church that there are many in the church that are leading you astray. Don't be led astray through immaturity, traditions, false teachings, false hearings, false prophecies. Just know Jesus and Jesus is in you. You know your love is made complete when you walk like Jesus walked. So if somebody tells you to walk differently than Jesus, that's a lie. That's a false truth. Don't do it. That's a deception, a temptation, which could produce a trial. And lastly, and I'll begin to wrap it up, because I want to make sure we're all safe in Christ. So you see it through the scriptures. It goes on in 27. As for you, me, the anointing, that's where we get the word charisma or charismatic. You receive from him, that's Jesus, remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. Why don't you need anyone to teach you? Because you can all go to the written scriptures, look at the red letter, study Jesus, and then you know the truth. Because the Holy Spirit's job is to always remind you of Jesus. So that's why if you don't want to be deceived, you've got to take time and read the Holy Scriptures and get to know the red letters in Jesus. Or else you could be deceived. Does that make sense? Okay? Don't need anyone to teach you, but as his anointing, his charisma, teaches you about all things, and as an anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as, everybody say just as, just as. it has taught you remain in him, that him is Jesus. And it shows that if you continue farther, you'll see that more clearly. 28. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears. So there's some far left extreme charismatics that are getting confused, but this is very clearly saying this is about Jesus because the Holy Spirit's been poured out at this point and He's already appeared at Pentecost. So this is talking about the appearing of Jesus coming back. So it's encouraging us to remain in Jesus. It says, so that when He appears, we may be confident and unashamed before Him at His coming. Again, His second coming. So if you want confidence and not be ashamed at that coming, just be Jesus. Live like Jesus. Everything about Jesus. He is your safeguard. He is the foundation. He's the way, the truth, and the life. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right is born of who? Him. Jesus. See how it's everyone? It's an absolute. To be Jesus. So that's our unifying person, our force, our foundation is Jesus Christ. And in that, you need to be careful for the far left or the far right. There is great deception on both sides. People saying, I heard from the Lord, and this is what I and we should do. No, if it doesn't look like Jesus, then it's not from the Lord. The Lord is Jesus. That is master. That is king. That is Jesus. And Alicia, you can come on up. I'm going to end with the way I started. John 14, 16, 26. Now in the Amplified Bible. It says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you the helper. So the Father gives us the helper. And in the, in the Amplified, using the Greek and amplification, the helper is called the comforter, advocate, intercessor, Counselor, strengthener, and standby. I thought that was interesting, even how it says stand, standby in the Amplified. The Holy Spirit is here as a standby 
to help us about everything about the return of Jesus Christ. To lead us into Jesus now and forevermore. To be with you forever. He will be with us forever. But the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby, the Holy Spirit who the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me and act on my behalf. I love that part of the Amplified. It's a great, great clarifier. Catch this at the end. To represent me and act on my behalf. That's Jesus saying that. So the Holy Spirit's job is to represent Jesus and to act on Jesus' behalf. Is to help you to become like Jesus. To bring Jesus back. It's to glorify Jesus. It's all about Jesus Christ. He will teach you all things and He will help you to remember everything that I have told you. John 15, 26 says, But the Helper, the Comforter, the Advocate, the Intercessor, the Counselor, the Strengthener, the Standby comes, whom I will send to you from the Father. That is the Spirit of what? Truth. It's very easy to understand if the Holy Spirit is truly speaking. You better see Jesus and hear Jesus in that. If you don't see Jesus or the life of Jesus, or what Jesus said, it's a lie. Clear enough to see. And it goes on, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, He will testify and bear witness about me. The Holy Spirit will testify, speak of Jesus. It's all about Jesus and bear witness to Jesus. It's about testifying who Jesus is and that He's coming. That is bearing witness. That is who we are to become. That is the gospel. That is the Messiah. That is everything. John 16, 14, I end with this. He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. That's Jesus speaking. The Holy Spirit will glorify and honor Jesus because He, the Holy Spirit, will take from what is mine and disclose it to you. The role of the Holy Spirit is to disclose everything about truth, about Jesus and who you are in Christ and about Christ coming. That is the spirit of truth. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is salvation. Salvation brings peace and comfort now and forevermore. Amen.